Good day, everybody. This is Dr. Sanjay Sanyal, Professor Department Chair. This is going to be a demonstration of the clinical, developmental, and the functional aspect of the sacrum and the coccyx. Sacrum is called sacrum because it is a sacred bone. It is shaped like a heart, roughly. The reason why it is shaped like this is because the lower portion of the sacrum, rapidly tapering, is because the lateral muscles of the lower pieces of the sacrum, especially S3, S4, and S5, they degenerate during embryonic life. In other words, they do not develop. The reason is because they are not concerned with weight bearing. Only the first part of the sacrum, the first piece and a little bit of the second piece of the sacrum is concerned with weight bearing. So therefore the lateral muscles here disappear and that's the reason why the sacrum is tapering. If you were to take a look at the dorsal aspect of the sacrum, you will find that the sacrum has got multiple ridges on its dorsal aspect. And these have been divided into three parts. We have median ridge, and that is referred to as the median crest. This is formed by the fusion of the spinous processes of the first, second, third, and fourth piece of the sacrum. The fifth spinous process does not fuse, and that remains open as a sacral hiatus, which I shall mention just a little later in more detail. Then on either side of the median crest, we have this ridge here. This is called the intermediate crest. This is formed by the fusion of the articular processes of the sacral pieces. Again, the articular process of the fifth one does not fuse and it forms the cornu of the sacral hiatus. And laterally, we have these crests here. These are referred to as the lateral crest. This is formed by the fusion of the transverse processes of the sacrum, which form the lateral crest. And of course, we can clearly see the dorsal sacral foramina Classically, there should be four dorsal sacral foramen and there should be four ventral sacral foramen. Initially, till the age of about 20 years, the sacral pieces are separate and they are covered by hyaline cartilage and they are separated by intervertebral discs. Starting from approximately the age of 20 years, going right up to middle life, the sacral pieces, they start fusing and they get completely fused till about middle life. The same thing principle applies to the coccyx also. The first piece of the coccyx fuses with the sacrum and the other pieces of the coccyx, namely the second, third and fourth piece of the coccyx, they also fuse with the first piece and they form the sacro coccygeal piece as one entity as we can see here. Coming to some functional aspects of the sacrum. This is the sacral promontory. This is the anterior projecting portion of the body of S1. This is clinically very important because we use this as a landmark when we are measuring in a female during uh, obstetrics examination to determine the true or the obstetric conjugate, which is the one of the anterior posterior diameters of the female pelvis. These are the transverse process of the first piece of sacrum, which is referred to as the ala of the sacrum. Ala means wing. And this is the anterior margin of the ala. The ala of the sacrum, laterally, it articulates with the ilium and forms what is known as the sacroiliac joint. So to understand the sacroiliac joint, we shall take a look at the lateral aspect of the sacrum and see how it works. So I have shown this in another specimen here. So this is the anterior portion and this is the posterior portion. The anterior portion is relatively smooth and this is covered by hyaline cartilage. This forms the synovial part of the sacroiliac joint. This relatively smooth portion of the sacrum is referred to as the auricular process. This articulates with the similar auricular process of the ilium to form the synovial part of the sacroiliac joint. Posteriorly, this portion, which is rough, is the tuberosity of the sacrum, which articulates with the corresponding tuberosity of the ilium to form the syndesmosis or the non synovial part of the sacroiliac joint. And bridging the disc gap between the sacrum and the ilium, we have some very strong ligamentous fibers, which are referred to as the interosseous sacroiliac ligament. These interosseous sacroiliac ligament constitute approximately 10 square centimeters of the surface area. And they are the ones which constitute the maximum strength of the sacroiliac joint. As a result of this strong sacroiliac joint, there is only very restricted mobility. And how does this mobility work? To understand the mobility, let's take a look at the next piece of the sacrum here. When a person is jumping from a height or when a person is standing erect, 
the force is transmitted from the lumbar region to the sacrum at the lumbosacral joint, which incidentally the angle is approximately 130 to 160 degrees. And the force is then transmitted laterally through the ale of the sacrum to the ilium. And from there, when the person is standing, the force is transmitted through the femur. And when the person is sitting, the force is transmitted through the ischial tuberosity. The weight of the body, it tends to rotate the sacrum approximately through an axis somewhere in the middle of the first piece of the sacrum and tends to push the first part of the sacrum downwards and forwards. But in this movement, it is restricted by two strong ligaments. One of the ligament is on the lateral aspect, that is the sacro tuberous ligament, and the other is the sacro spinous ligament, which restricts the downward and the forward movement. And so therefore, the sacroiliac joint provides extreme strength, stability, and restricted mobility during standing, jumping, and moving. And it also allows a little bit of mobility during pregnancy and childbirth to allow the fetal head to descend down which of course is mediated by the female hormones. To continue with the sacroiliac joint, the sacroiliac joint can be likened to that of a suspension bridge. In a suspension bridge, basically we have three structures. One, we have the bridge itself, then we have the suspension cables, and then we have the pillars or the pylons. So just think of a suspension bridge when you think of the sacroiliac joint. The sacrum itself, is like the bridge itself. The pylons will be the two ilium, one on either side. And connecting the sacrum, especially the tuberosity of the sacrum with the tuberosity of the ilium, as I mentioned just now, we have the strong interosseous sacroiliac joint, sacroiliac ligaments. They constitute the suspension cables. So that is the good analogy to understand the functional dynamics of the sacroiliac joint. Coming to some clinical correlations pertaining to the sacrum. Let's now focus on the dorsal aspect, what I referred earlier to as the sacral hiatus. What exactly is the sacral hiatus? Sacral hiatus is this inverted V-shaped opening on the dorsal aspect of the sacrum, which connects with the sacral canal. As, a, as we know in the sacral canal, we have the remnants of the corda equina. How is the sacral hiatus produced? It is formed by the non-fusion or the absence of the spinous process of S5 and therefore there is an opening here. The lateral margins of the sacral hiatus are referred to as the sacral cornu, which incidentally are continuous with the cornu of the coccyx. The lateral margins of the sacral hiatus, the so-called sacral cornu, are formed by the inferior articular processes of the S5 sacral vertebra. The opening of the sacral hiatus is produced not only by the absence of the spinous process of S5, but it is also produced by the absence of the lamina of the S5. There's a very important clinical correlation pertaining to the sacral hiatus. The sacral hiatus in life is covered by a membrane called the sacrococcygeal ligament. And this sacral hiatus is located at the lower angle, lower angle of the sacral triangle. The sacral triangle can be seen on a living person on the back. If you draw a line, horizontal line connecting the two posterior superior iliac spines and then bring the, those two lines down at the upper end of the gluteal cleft, just at the place where the gluteal cleft starts is the location of the sacral hiatus. And this is the location that we can use to give caudal epidural analgesia for painless childbirth or obstetric analgesia by injecting the dye into the sacral epidural space. We by injecting the anesthetic agent through the sacral epidural space. So this is a very useful route of giving caudal epidural anesthesia. Likewise, we can also give anesthetic agents through the dorsal sacral foramina and that is referred to as the transsacral epidural analgesia. To continue with the clinical correlations of the sacrum, especially the coccyx is so-called tailbone is actually derived from the caudal eminence in embryonic life. The word coccyx literally means kaku because it is shaped like the beak of a bird. And that's why it is called coccyx. When a person is sitting, this coccyx can come in contact with the surface on which the person is sitting. And if the person falls hard on his buttock, sometimes there can be injury to the coccyx. It can even be fractured and can produce a painful condition known as coccydynia. The coccyx gives attachment to the coccygeous muscle the gluteus maximus 
and the anocoxygen ligament. These are all the points which I wanted to let you know about the sacrum and the coccyx. Thank you very much for watching. Dr. Sanjay Sanyal signing out. If you have any questions or comments, please put them in the comment section below. Have a nice day.